So uh, good evening, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to uh, welcome you all here um, to the uh, Energy and Environment Division uh, evening lecture for uh, for March. So um, this lecture is being webcast, and uh, I'd like to welcome also a group in the Energy Research Institute in Cork who uh, who have um, who have uh, come together there to uh, to view this webcast. So that is being hosted by our uh, our Energy and Environment Division committee colleague uh, Paul Dean. And I'd like to welcome anyone, anyone else who's, uh, who's uh, viewing the webcast online. So the, the lecture this evening is uh, entitled The Energy Aspects of Modern Wastewater Treatment Plants. So I think it's, uh, it's great in the, the current climate where uh, there's a lot of uh, negative uh, sentiment and comment around uh, water and wastewater that the Energy and Environment Division are able to present uh, something positive on the subject. So we have... Um, we have two speakers tonight. We have uh, Michael O'Sullivan, who's here. He's the engineering lead with uh, EPS Group's large contracts division. Uh, Michael has 14 years experience in the, uh, in the wa water and wastewater treatment uh, sector. And he's also the chair of the EPS Energy and Environment Division since 2009. Our second speaker then is uh, Eric John Zanbergen. I got that right, Eric. Uh, and uh, Eric has 25 years experience of the uh, water and wastewater uh, sector. He's, uh, he is the director for water technology and uh, he specializes in, international co in, in working with international companies for the introduction of new technologies and connecting technology business partners worldwide. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Michael, our first speaker. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Engineers Ireland, the Energy and Environment Division, and the co-sponsors, the Water and Environmental Engineering Society and the Energy Institute for hosting us tonight. I'd like to thank you all for coming, and including those online watching. And uh, it's a good opportunity for Eric and myself to talk about some of the modern innovations and aspects of uh, wastewater treatment design that's come out recently in relation to in relation to um, energy. So, firstly, I suppose, why, why is it important? Well, if according to the US EPA, 2% are minimum of any developed nation's electrical consumption is consumed by wastewater treatment plants. I mean, to put it in context that's more clear, that would be the equivalent of leaving out in every house in the country. That um, on top of that, um, we look at the Irish Waters, Water Services Draft Strategic Plan, where like the nation plan, national plan, there's a demand to reduce by 33% our electrical consumption by the year 2020 and that we'll have to make further reductions by the year 2040 yet to be set. So it's very clear why energy efficiency is such a large driver to change in the design of wastewater treatment at present. If we don't look at innovative ways and innovative technologies of redesigning our plants, then clearly these targets could not possibly be met. So today we're here to talk about two such changes to, to the, to the uh, market. The first I'll take you through is a biogas generation tool known as BioCrack. If you're still awake at the end of that, my colleague Eric will talk to you about the uh, Narida system uh, developed by Royal Haskell and DHV, and it's an entirely new biological process to improve energy efficiency. So, moving on to the BioCrack first. What is it? Where does it come from? Well, start where does it come from first? It was developed by a company, Vogelsand, more popularly known for rotary load pumps and maceration equipment. They had a local inventor came up with this concept and they bought it off and developed it themselves. It came on the market in March 2010 and was highly picked up very quickly, mostly in the agricultural sector. Digestion, anaerobic digestion in Germany 
was very big in, in the agricultural sector. So, um, how does it work? Well, I suppose to start, I'll just mention anaerobic digestion and overview. It is essentially a process, or rather a collection of processes, that uh, stabilize sludge treatment in wastewater treatment plants. It's, um, in base terms, it's the decomposition of volatile organic solids in an environment absent of molecular oxygen. So, it's a um, very desirable technology because of uh, the end product, where it releases biogas, largely methane, which can then be used as a power source of, uh, for generating power on the site. That's the thing. It's not a new technology. The first digesters goes back as far as 1859. It's uh, built in Leper Connolly in India. Um, it was used in the early 1900s for street lighting in Devon. But as we know, it kind of came around in the 1930s. It became developed in Germany to the manner that we'd know it today. Why is it not taken off before? Well, the problem with anaerobic digestion is it's a very time-consuming process. It's a long, particularly the initial hydrolysis stage. It, the time it takes to get through the process can be restrictive to how effective it is. Now, this is mostly down to the low biogradability of the cell membrane walls and the presence of biopolymers in the sludge. Yeah. So, why, what is it that you would do to get at that? Naturally, you would lose the ways of trying to access the nutrients within the membrane, get through it, and try to release it into the sludge quicker. This is where the biocrack steps in. As well as other technologies aim at the same principle, they're all the same. We try to get over that hydrolysis stage, speed it up to try to get your end of your process quicker. So, the biocrack. The biocrack operates by first stage, isn't shown here, but it's maceration. It's always predated by a maceration, and that's no just for conditioning the sludge for, for the electrokinetic uh, treatment. The maceration will essentially get rid of any solid particles or solid synthesis, biosolids in suspension. It gets a nice consistency and it, it prevents any ragging and problems you may have in your digester. It's then pumped through these electrodes. Now these electrodes are high voltage alternating current probes. They run through and they generate electrokinetic force within that pipe and the sludge is pumped past them. Now, when, that, when the sludge is subjected to the, that high voltage force, it ruptures the cell walls and releases the contents of the cell, including all the nutrients, into the sludge, which allows the digestion microorganisms to activate. I mean, essentially, it gives you a very highly active substrate to allow the fermentation process progress a lot quicker speed. So, bringing it to the Irish market, why, how we got it here in the first place? I suppose we have to highlight that we have an existing relationship with Vogelsand and we had previously done a screening project with them where we used some of their lobe and macerators into for, for dewatering on screens. So we knew from talking to them that they had, that they were doing this in the background. We were very interested in it for a number of reasons. I mean, it's, look, we're in the contracting game and it's a substantial lower investment cost than anything else in the market. It had a very small footprint, which meant we could move it around very easily from site to site. It had extremely low, if it actually improved the maintenance requirements on the big due to maceration. And, so going, and the energy consumption, each electrode was only giving 34 or 35 watts of energy it's only four, so it was negligible comp parasitic energy compared to other, in this other other technologies we could have used. So, moving if we met with them, which we had been going ongoing, we talked about how they were using it in their agricultural, and it was it was very similar, we must say, to municipal digestion. 
So we spoke to them about the possibilities of moving it into municipal wastewater, this, uh, which they didn't have references, but they were, excuse me, slip of the hand, they were very interested in obviously developing it. It had only been on the market a number of months. So they did in-house trials to see would it, would it behave differently on municipal wastewater than it would on agricultural maize and dung as it had been digesting up to then. And they found very positive results themselves internally. So we got, we progressed together with a six week trial at a treatment plant in Drogheda where we put it on the recirculation line of uh, one of the digesters up there. Now Drogheda we chose it's easy to get there, and importantly, it's got a very low um, sludge, uh, sludge retention time. But um, the initial findings from that trial were extremely significant in terms of gas production. And they were exactly what we were looking for. So we progressed to the next phase. We were looking to get it in house. Now, to get it permanently into the market, we basically went to the SAI. In 2011, they had a better energy workplace scheme going. So there was grant funding available for companies that were open to developing their own technologies with the end goal of uh, improving energy efficiency regardless. Of. It was trying to jumpstart the industry, if you like. So we got successful with that grant aid, and we used it. Part of that, we, we obviously made investments uh, the majority investment would have been done by EPS ourselves. But we produced two units. Now, we bought the macerator pump, the load pump, or the macerator equipment, the load pump, and the electrodes from Vogelsang. And then we uh, manufactured the rest and the MCC and controls in-house. And uh, we installed the first one in Dundalk, was in February 2012. The Second one in Drogheda was up and running by June 2012. So these are just uh, to give you a, a, a sight of the, the plants. You can see the digester size, I suppose, is relevant to this. Now, in Drogheda, one digester is running. That's why we have such a low retention time. Neither of these plants are up to capacity. In fact, on docks, since the unfortunate absence of, uh, of the agio is quite down at present, but the volumes are important here. We have one digester running in Drogheda. We, so it's actually over, running over capacity in the digester, even though the plant is under capacity. That's why we had a uh, slow residence time in that digester. And that's what benefited, as you'll see when I get into some of the figures later. Drogheda, the sheer scale of the digesters, they are quite enormous there. So we, um, it doesn't have the same impact. But either way, as a combined, it was a very successful project, leading us to last year, installing one that um, in Tullamore at the entry plant. It's a much significantly smaller size. So uh, again, in Tullamore, you can see we're trying to package these digesters, hence the, the gas storage balloon is gone and now mounted as part of the roof, more like the German agricultural model. But. Uh, I suppose we see it as a, a way to develop an old technology and move it forward. This is actually a picture of the Tullamore biocrack system. You can see the panel macerator pump at this side and the electrodes, and it's just plumbed into the recirculation system within the building then. So what were we hoping to gain? I mean, it's very simple. We were looking to produce more biogas. To, the idea of that would be to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, electricity on site, and natural gas as well, of course. But during the trial, many, sub, many other benefits were realized, some of which we had underestimated the scale of. So in terms of biogas production, I mean, the trial in Drogheda was extremely good. It was over 30% increase in the biogas production on site. Um, the figure there of 1,091 Obviously, that's probably a best case. When you see the figures later, you'll see. But um, in general, on average, since it operated in 2012, it's about 30%, over 30% additional biogas on that plant. You can see the increase of nearly a third in our CHP run hours. 
which is any, any run hours on a combined heat and power engine means we're producing electricity on site for our own purposes. So the electricity figure here is a little misleading. It looks a bit low because, as you see, it's the figure from 2011 versus 2012, but in Drogheda we only turned it on in June. So it's actually, I don't have the figure there, but I'll tell you it's a 22% increase in the kilowatt hours generated on site. And that's between Drogheda and Dundalk. It's about 28 on Drogheda and so on. Um, so one of the other techniques we found that we didn't really expect, but uh, due to the conditioning nature of this technology, we found the level of methane in the biogas was increased between one and a half and two percent, which again just leads, it's an additional benefit, it, it would reduce maintenance time on your CHPs, but obviously the quality of gas depends, it impacts the meat directly proportionally on the maintenance requirements. So this is more a trend just to show again, we can see where they started up, the various units, and it's a combined, it's not the clearest one, we move on to other trends we have here, but you can see the average creeping up in methane quality. Here is an interesting one, the combined CHP run hours, come all the way from 2011, which is giving you beforehand. The purple line you'll see in the center is Dundalk coming online. The green line, excuse me, you see is actually the Drogheda CHP coming online. What you will notice is not only that our usage hasn't changed drastically, but our reliance on natural gas has completely reduced. So it's, a, it's been a large benefit to us. And if we break it down by site, it's shown probably clearer. If I show you Dundalk, for instance, I mean, you can see there's not a very substantial change in the usage, except we are using less natural gas. Now, we're obviously part of that's kiltered, we're less wasteful with it than we would have been uh, before we got into the trial systems. So obviously the usage figures may have been higher day one. Um, Drawhead though, this is the extremely significant one because it's eliminated. We don't use natural gas on that site anymore. How this came into being is, it's essentially, back to what I said, it's that Hydrolysis, the sludge hydrolysis stage, the first step of the anaerobic digestion. The biodegradability of those cell walls is so significant. Drogheda is a 14-day sludge retention when we did these trials. Dundalk was closer to 30 because of the volume. So you can see essentially at 30 days, it's time limited. At 30 days, it's gone through the process whether you, soup, whether you improve it or not. On a tighter scale, it hasn't completed the full process and you've encouraged it to complete it, which is why you see the significant difference in Drada. How we see this important and how we moved it on, I suppose, both of these plants were a traditional method where we had CHP and we had a supporting boiler because the idea was CHPs were a little, a little sensitive. And Tullamore last year, we've got rid of that philosophy. We make money on biogas. We can produce our own power on site. So Tullamore is the first plant, there are no boilers. We've gone, if the CHB, you have a standby. If we make enough, they're plumbed to run duty duty. But we keep our CHBs operating. And the way to do that, get rid of the safety nets. Get rid of the boilers you will insist on keeping our CHPs operating and we insist on keeping our biogas up nowadays. So, other benefits. It's one we get to that's extremely significant and it was the reduction in sludge solid content. This results in massive reductions in the amount of sludge exported from the site, the waste sludges going out in skips. Obviously, the improvement in the consistency of the digested sludge led to dewatering savings. And uh, coupled with the volume reduction, we have obviously a lot less polymer being used in the dewatering process and chemical addition. Um, it also actually reduced a lot of forming problems in um, Dundalk, which meant we could reduce our um, 
ferric chloride because we were trying to reduce for, and for hydrogen sulfide levels. So it had some unexpected benefits, the lesser ones, but the biggest one here, a 33% reduction in the sludge being removed from that site since we've put these systems in place. I mean, it, it's obviously the polymer is very important and that, but the real thing, and this heat transfer efficiencies, now that could be a lot to the consistency of the sludges being so greatly improved. It's obviously, as you imagine, lends itself to a more efficient heat transfer, which again means you're losing less of your power that you generate in actually keeping the digesters up to temperature. But this is Drogheda sludge exported. The green line is us bringing that bio crack online. Um, it's, 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 it's been extremely important. Even Dundalk, where we're not producing the same, we're only maybe a 12% increase in biogas, we still have a significant increase on sludge reduction. So a 33% reduction overall in a year since we put this on. To put it in terms, I suppose, that's a bit clearer. <coughs> the skips are 30 meter cubed on both sides, or 50 meter cubed. We generally fill them with about 30 meter cubed at most. So again, that's at least 250 less skips a year leaving these sites. That's, if we take not just the energy savings and natural gas electrical power, but the carbon footprint reduction by that alone, and even if we move to more basic terms, the effect on a neighbourhood, if you live near these plants, of nearly one truck a day being removed from the road you live on, is obviously helping us with our relationship with our neighbours. So, again, very significant. Obviously, the mass radiating pump is there to protect the electrodes, but as I say, the heat transfer, the blockages, it's essentially maintenance free. Because the mass radiator does the maintenance for you, there's very little alternative maintenance required on the system. Um, we tried different chemicals. There was more different types of polymer, again, reductions, not a significant thing. The average three kilowatt an hour, that's actually including the pump and mass radiator. When you look at that, you have to keep in mind that we put it in as the recirculation system. So we're replacing an alternative recirculation pump that would be doing the same flow. So essentially it's electrodes that are their parasitic load at 35 watts apiece for them in this particular instance. So the pump wouldn't actually be considered parasitic because you need it for digestion operation. So um, I suppose that's an overview of the biocrack. And look, we like to think that it's an innovative way of improving a technology that we already had on site, a way of certainly getting uh, the most of a, out of, a, out of a, an asset. And um, for, look, for very simple terms, you're essentially helping reduce the reliance on fossil fuels for a plant that's by its nature designed to supposed to be helping the environment. It just makes common sense for us to be doing all we could to be reducing this at source. So uh, thank you very much for your time. We'll move on to um, the Narita aspect of the talk. If you don't mind, might hold questions till the end, just because not everyone may want to sit through that aspect. We'll do both talks and have the questions afterwards, if that suits. Thank you very much. <coughs> My name is Eric Zembergen and I work for Royal Sconing DHV and I have to start with a warning. I can get carried away a bit about this topic, so if you want to leave now or maybe better interrupt me if I start expanding on it. 
And the other thing is, I will come to the topic of today, the energy aspects, but I need to talk a little bit about the technology first, otherwise, you know, but okay. Um, what it's about, it's, uh, it's a technology called Nereda, and it's aerobic granular sludge or biomass technology. Don't get worried, I'll explain to you what that is. What it's all about is that these uh, two glasses you see conventional activated sludge in the left hand glass and right you see that the sludge is at the bottom, that is the granular sludge, the Nareda sludge. Yeah, so it's, um, it has excellent and robust settling uh, properties. It's compact and easy to operate. Now, how does, th how does that work? What we do is we change the biomass and there's no big secret about it because it's nothing different from conventional activated sludge which has been around for over 100 years now. Yeah? And what we do is we manipulate it from a biotechnical way and hydraulically and we make a selection. Yeah? It's Darwin all over again and the fittest will survive and those are the ones that make the aer aer aerobic granulars. It's a bit of a tongue twister, sorry for that. That results in these excellent uh, settling properties, and I'll come to the other advantages later. Okay, now what is a granular in uh, wastewater treatment terms? Yeah, there's a nicely academic uh, um, definition there. For now, just remember it's bigger than 0.2 millimeters, and the sludge volume index uh, 5 and 30 are comparable. Yeah, okay. So um, how do we, how does it look like? And then if you'll see a little movie coming up now, if it all works, and then we'll shake it about. And the right hand one has the granular sludge in, the left hand is the conventional activated sludge. So just imagine this is the rate in the reactor, the aeration switches off and you get the settling phase. And there you see the granules going down and the other sludge is still thinking about going down, is still hesitant on that. This is after 15 seconds. This is after five minutes, then, then 15 minutes. So what you see is that at the end, the, the volumes are the same, but that the, the settling properties are, um, uh, demonstrated here. Yeah, it's pure biomass. There are other systems where you have a carrier material to make the granular that's not there. It's all biomass. So there's no support media. And it also allows us, and especially in industrial applications, we see that we can go up to MLSSs up to 15 grams per liter, which makes the treatment plants uh, very small. Okay, and we get a stable and reliable operation. Okay, if you now compare it to a uh, conventional activated sludge system and you want to remove nutrients, either nitrogen or phosphorus, basically how you do that is you make separate sections in the treatment plant and you pump the water away and there are different conditions all the time and that means that the processes go there. How does it now work in an aerator reactor? All those processes, so the nitrogen removal and the phosphorus removal, all take place in the granule itself. And the trick is that there's a gradient in the oxygen concentration going from the outside of the granule to the inside. Yeah, so there's transport by diffusion and not by pumping. Okay, now if you now look again at that plant, so that's gonna be the topic of today, the first energy saver is you're not pumping water around anymore to get it from the one section of the plant into the next section, but those processes actually take place within the granule itself. Okay. Now, I've compared it to continuous systems. You would maybe say, how does it compare to an SBR, a traditional SBR system? And there the differences are, the, the two notable differences. The time that it takes to settle the sludge is much shorter so after aeration, you can start um, drawing the water much quicker. And the other advantage is that in this system, we fill and draw at the same time. So compared to a conventional SBR, the cycle times are much shorter 
and also we can have the higher uh, mixed liquor suspended solids. Okay. Now, then there's a little bit of advertising here, but what we also see is that the granular sludge responds remarkably robust to less favorable conditions. So there can be a shock in salt concentration, for instance, or what we see in industrial applications that the pH can be very high or very low, or there can be chemical spikes or toxic spikes. And then we see that it responds um, very robust. How do we know that we had in a few occasions, we had a conventional activated sludge system running in parallel to the radar. Okay. And how do we think this works? On the left-hand side, you see it, uh, an activated sludge flock. It's far more open. And you see the organisms all there in the different colors. And what the, happens in the granular sludge is, uh, you know, it's like back in kindergarten, they build a little house for themselves, a polymer house. And that's where the organisms hide themselves and are more robust to these uh, shocks by either toxics or a change in the pH. Okay, what does this uh, mean in practical sense? <clears throat> so how do you, so when you say, Eric, the footprint is smaller, how should we imagine that? Well, you see uh, the upper drawing, that's a traditional treatment plant with the aeration basins and then the final clarifiers, there's the round tanks with the bridges over it. And basically the final clarifiers go away. So you have a smaller footprint to start with. This is a, this is a well-known treatment plant in the Netherlands, just outside of The Hague. And if it, we were chosen to apply the narrator technology, everything with the red cross would go away. Then there are energy savings. And the en energy savings are due to two things. You're not pumping water around. You know it in the egg, yeah? <laughs> You're not pumping water around all the time from the one section to the other. So there's less rotary equipment. And also the, uh, we see that the transfer of oxygen goes more efficient in the reactor itself. That together obviously leads to lower construction and operational cost. Okay. Now, how did this all start? You know, we are in Ireland, you guys do like a drink. It all starts at the Oktoberfest in Munich, and there's two professors, uh, Professor Wildener and Professor Verloosdrecht, and they have a wager, and they say, who can make this activated granular sludge first, aerobic granular sludge first, because anaerobic was already there. Now, the wager, how it turned out, they had a long time before they could drink the beer together, because the research started in the, in the 90s on the University in Delft, and the first full-scale installation the construction started in 2010. So I'm sure these guys are thirsty in the meantime. What's uh, important here is that you see that there comes a boost in the whole thing when the, when the research moves out of the university lab into the field, and there's piling testing at uh, wastewater treatment plants, but there's also the first in the industrial applications, and it's fundamental to developing a technology that there are, are parties willing to invest in such a solution. And what I'll show you later is also do it only in the Netherlands. Uh, to get such a technology going, you need a, a worldwide spread, otherwise you won't get there. Okay. Now this shows the, the timeline a little bit. And I think what's important is that, you know, the research starts in 1993, and if you look at it in 2013, we don't only have a full-scale installation, but it's, uh, it's in the same dimensions as the largest SBRs in the world. Yeah, so that's 20 years of research and development going to, it, to implementation. On the right-hand side, by the way, you see a, a pilot unit with two Nareda reactors in it. Okay, now. How does that now compare to the larger SBRs? And here you see the development. So on the horizontal arc, there's the years. And you saw that in the beginning of the 2000s, the world's, world's largest SBR tanks were applied. And by the way, those are here in Dublin at the Rings End Wastewater Treatment Plant. And what you see is that in the development now with the Gamma Walder plant, for you on the far right hand side, we're now, now up to 9,000 cubic meters per cell. So we're coming in the region of Alanya and Cardiff. And it means that we're also in the practical application of the technology we're getting there. I will come back to the energy aspects, don't be afraid. 
Okay. Now, what's it all about? It's developing worldwide. It started in uh, 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 Portugal in South Africa. We had the demo and first the pilots in the Netherlands, the demos in Portugal in South Africa, then the full scales in the Netherlands. And now it's all in Brazil and all over the world. And the good thing you see it in bold at the bottom there, it's, uh, it's also coming to Ireland. Okay, how do we do that? We deliver that internationally. We don't do that all on our own. That would, oops, that's too quick. That would constrain it. So here in Ireland, we work together with Michael of APS in promoting the technology. If you ever want to visit an Areda plant, do yourself a huge favor, visit the one in South Africa. It's a tourist destination and you can see the in the meantime, it's on the Cape Coast. It's fantastic down there. Okay, now we go to APA, which is the mother of all Nereidas worldwide. Uh, it's in the center of the Netherlands and it had to replace an existing sewage treatment plant where the effluent standards were far more stringent than before and obviously it had to be done cost effective and uh, reduce energy consumption was a very strong uh, target of the client, the water board failure. Okay, here you see a bit the drawings. This is how it ended up. The existing plant, three, th over 30,000 people equivalent with the aeration basin and the final clarifier. There was only partial uh, uh, nitrogen removal and chemical phosphorus removal. That's the old plant. And in the new situation, we had to treat just under 60,000 people equivalent, full nitrogen removal and biological P removal. And what's unique here is that you discharge to a little brook, very sensitive, so we ha have a final polishing afterwards. There it is. So the three tanks are the three Nareda reactors, the round tanks. And what you see here at the bottom, that is the final polishing step by sand filtration. Okay. Here's an aerial view of the same installation. Okay, I'll press it now. The, the gentleman you see in the middle was our crown prince at that stage, he's now our king. Obviously very proud that he opened our installation. Um, what happened is it came in 2011 online and we increased the fee to it step by step and after four months it was treating 100%. So that means that that process of selecting the bacteria that I, or the organisms that I described earlier took four months to really get going. <clears throat> the effluent quality was good from the beginning onwards and, in, and improved uh, all the time. And I'll come to that now in figures, there was a low energy. Okay, and then the other nice thing was, the idea was to maintain the old plant until we were absolutely certain that the new plant was working. But because the Crown Prince was coming, this thing was de demolished in advance because, um, you know, we had to have a nice day for him. It also meant that we had a lot of faith in the technology, yes. Um, this is for the question hours. What you can remember from that is that all the figures are way be uh, above 90% so that the removal is okay. Let's focus on the energy side of it. If you look on the table and the lower figures there, you, you see that the benchmark of similar Dutch treatment plants with post-treatment, you used 37.5 kilowatt hours per people equivalent per annum at the load. And there's another benchmark of 33.4. What the, what the tender called for, what we had to guarantee is that we would bring it below 22.7 kilowatts per people equivalent per annum yeah, and add full load and full load is design load. But as the, the, uh, the, the load to the plant always you design for the future has to grow, you have to test it in di different circumstances. So we, t we uh, tested it at actual load and we were already below the 22.2 or below the 22.7 kilowatts per PE per annum. And if you work that around, with the figures and the formulas agreed up front, then it would be 16.3 kilowatts per PE per annum at that full design load. So that's a remarkable low figure compared to the 22.7, and it's also remarkably low against the whole benchmark. Yeah, 
And in all fairness, this is a benchmark over all the plants. Probably you would have to benchmark it against the 10 best performing. But still then there's a very significant uh, reduction of energy use and consumption. And that was the topic of today. Okay, then we go to the Gamma Walder plant, which is now the, the plant I'm very proud of and we uh, were able to, uh, to implement in the full force of the competition and it's addition of 140,000 people equivalent to an existing plant. Here you see it. And now it's good. Here you also see the change in footprint. So the whole upper part of the, that's the existing plant and that takes Okay, it takes care of 235,000 people equivalent, uh, but the under 140,000 are treated in these two reactors, and the other tank you see is a buffer uh, to equalize the flow a little bit. Okay, again here, um, and the difference with an, an APE is that there's no post-treatment. It was started up in uh, June 2013. We hit the guarantee period over uh, the end of 2014 and it's all within the uh, characteristics effluent requirements and the energy uh, requirements okay <clears throat> so what's the interesting thing about it now if you visit the plant now and you talk to the operators what they do there is that they express the cost of treating one cubic meter of wastewater and they know and they have it for the existing plant and for the narrator and what you see is that they're gradually pushing more and more and more load towards the narrator. So you use less e energy there. It, it says he is 60% lower, but the AB system is not that efficient. A and it also means that in the operational practice, they're moving it towards the part that uses less energy and, and therefore less cost of treating it. Okay. This is for the insiders, the comparison between the effluent standards for, uh, for APE and Gamma World, and that explains why we need the polishing step afterwards. Okay. In summary, when you compare the uh, activated sludge, or the, sorry for that, uh, um, conventional activated sludge systems with the Nareda, I think for today it's very important that we see that there's a significant savings in energy in treating it. And, 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 in, and therefore in operational cost. And that makes me very excited. Okay. What is there now in the future? Yeah? We, I told you that the, the organism build their own little house and it's nice and cozy there and the house is built of a bo uh, biopolymer and we call that alginate. And alginate is used in the paper industry but also in the pharmaceutical industry and in the <coughs> uh, food industry. It's easy to harvest, and it has a potential high market value. Now again, and uh, you saw it in Michael's presentation, that means that if we win the alginate from the sludge, it means that less sludge has to be disposed of, and that's obviously the first main benefit. But if you think ahead and you think in the circular economy, we're actually winning the resources back from the wastewater. So now maybe treating wastewater is a pain, but it will be fun when we can recuperate all these energy and these resources from the wastewater stream, and that's in the future. Well, I'm, I'm sure you're all excited about it. I can see that, and it's coming to Ireland, and the first plant will be uh, Kluna Kilty, which is going to receive water uh, in May of this year. Hey, I have to stop, you see that? And, and the other one will be in Kluna Kilty, end of 2015. You can read more about it on our website, and I thank you for your attention. I would like to open the, uh, the floor for questions and maybe I'd ask uh, Michael and Eric if they would uh, uh, take, take a seat at the front here and uh, take a seat, okay. Yeah. And uh, be because there are, um, there are uh, participants online, uh, we're going to ask you to talk into the microphone when you're uh, giving the answers, please. There's a microphone there. Thank you. So there's another microphone uh, here. If you could just uh, state your name and your affiliation uh, before uh, we ask the question.
Jerry Duncan, Energy and Environment Division. Just uh, comments and a question. Firstly, can I say that uh, I was one of the judges on the SEAI Energy Awards, which awarded the first prize to the Drogheda and the Dog Plants in 2012, which was relatively soon after that installation, and we were very much taken by that installation. Uh, and effectively, uh, I had to point out to some other judges that what we had to compare is not the total energy use on the site before or afterwards, but the amount of imported energy minus the exported energy, because they move, as you indicated, from significant natural gas use to actually exporting electricity. So it was an extremely successful implementation, and it was a retrofit into an existing plant. Now, I would also comment that some of you may have noticed that there seemed to be a significant improvement in the performance of the plant before the installation. And that, in my view, was, and the, uh, part of the reason the award was awarded, was there was a change of operator at the plant. And a contract company from Mallow came in and I was operating both plants. And I think this is very important in terms of wastewater treatment plants nationally. Because the traditional background of the operatives in those plants was effectively removing rags from screens, uh, that you are now moving to a high technology compared with what was the history of primary filtration. And you actually, to get the benefits of this type of technology, you actually have to change the operator culture totally because you're now operating a serious process plant and you need to have people on board who understand that and can operate it and can manage the systems and the information systems appropriately. So all I would say is it seems to be an absolutely excellent technology. I mean, 34 watts, what you were getting for it is incredible. And the sooner it's applied universally, the better. In relation to the Nareda project, and the question is, my understanding is, you may have heard the minister saying, etc., that the appointment of uh, Bordishka resulted in very substantial future capital savings in the Rings End plant. Now, what is involved, as far as I know, is that the nine-kilometre tunnel that was required to actually bring the phosphates and nitrates outside the Dublin Bay area uh, is being eliminated by the adoption of this type of technology and effectively the capital cost is coming down correspondingly. So the question is, is my understanding of what's proposed correct? Thank you. Um, well, I... Is it on? Uh, that question uh, I could see coming. Yeah, it's clear that uh, a massive SBR has rings end. You know, uh, you're, you would uh, like to apply something like uh, rubber granular sludge, there's no doubt about it. And that, 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 uh, that will, we have to look into that, for sure. But the, 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 the fundamental choice to treat further and discharge into the estuary is not dependent on the technology applied. And there are more technologies who can do that. But the, the existing technologies, as I understand it, the footprint was too large to permit their application in Ring's End. Uh, so is it the reduction footprint that actually lends this technology to be able to avoid having to build your pipeline to take the phosphates and the nitrates out? No, that, that's absolutely right. The only thing, in all fairness, is that not only... Um, aerobic granular sludge can achieve that. You know, this time hasn't stand still since the last evaluation. There are more technology with a smaller footprint and then we can reach that, yes. Thank you. You had a, a question for Michael, if I may, uh, Daniel Kassan, Gas Networks Ireland and the Energy and Environment Division. I saw on uh, one of your slides, uh, Michael, uh, the, the variation in the level of methane in the biogas, it went from, you know, I think around 50 or 60 percent up to, you know, 70 or 80. And uh, just wondering how, how you find running CHP plants on natural gas, which is 95 percent methane plus, and low, low uh, CV gas, does that cause you any problems? And uh, what, what are the other constituents of the, uh, of the biogas? Um, well, I, I, I would love to say we got a 70% at any point. Uh, our increase was actually only 1.5 um, to 1.9% increase in the methane levels. 
Um, all our CHPs, I think we have six now operating on three different plants. They're all dual fuel, so they operate on both natural gas and biogas. We haven't had a significant difference. I mean, obviously, natural gas is cleaner. It's a maintenance thing. Now, because we program preventative maintenance at intervals of every three months, it's difficult to, to highlight. We don't leave it run to destruction, our CHP machines. Um, what we do find in relation to biogas is it's very important to control the hydrogen sulfide levels in the coming out. In the, that's the one ingredient in the gas that will absolutely cause havoc with our sludge, is the hydrogen sulfide will eat through the internals of the engines. That is obviously not present in natural gas and probably the major difference. Um, we control it in most of the plants actually by ferric chloride dosing when required and we maintain it below about 150 parts per million but um, we find it's difficult to predict where when you'll get uh, levels of that <coughs> and obviously if you do have a problem with that it's normally due to your influent and um, it can require a bit of chemical addition that natural gas wouldn't require but um, we don't have to pay for it the biogas so very good thank you Thanks for that. Uh, John Kane from uh, the Energy Division of Veolia. Just, just wondering on the last point of uh, H2S and even siloxanes, is there any change in output from the technology you were talking earlier f by doing what you do? Is there any impact on the levels of H2S or silox siloxanes that's going in eventually into the CHP in the filter system? Well, I suppose to be honest with you, I can't realistically answer that because our levels had dipped prior to when we came into the plant there was historical data of ferric chloride levels be, being dosed and hydrogen sulfide levels reaching over 2,000 parts per million. But since we've corrected some of the operational issues, we found we haven't actually had to dose that chemical at any plant in the last three, four years. So we don't have records of it being an issue ongoing. There were historical, and it was at uh, the Dundalk plant in particular, that had an issue with H2S. It was prior to the biocrack. We say we assume it's an improvement because there's no reason. Uh, we've improved the gas in other quality. There's no reason we would be doing any harm. And we certainly haven't seen an increase in hydrogen sulfide levels. The 33% reduction here is uh, wet tonnage. So um, in terms of difference we had, we didn't change any of our systems downstream. Um, I suppose we had the equipment was predated the installation. We haven't, uh, we haven't gone back and altered it at the moment, although certain centrifuges are becoming more efficient at the moment. Um, we did notice an improvement in the, the watering characteristics of this sludge. Now, we're putting that down mostly to a consistency. We found that, be it the biocrack, but probably more often the macerator, is improving the consistency of the sludge an awful lot, hitting the watering. And that in itself is actually making it very easy to set the, the centrifuges up to run for longer periods. We have made operational changes to how we do water as well, which have had benefits. 
but it's not directly linked to the bio crack, so it's difficult to show figures that wouldn't be tainted, if you like. Um, the, no, the tonnage difference is the wet, so that's coming from the solids um, coming in. So it, it, it's we went to the same 20% dry solids limit as we did prior to the bio crack. We still have the same target that we have to hit for. So we both operate to the same limit. Sorry. It can be scaled down. All our units uh, run on four electrodes. Now, there is a, a standard offering they have with a twin electrode. It's uh, simply the same process, two less electrodes. Um, again, one of the main benefits, I suppose, to it uh, compared to if I was to consider against other technologies is because we're pumping through an electrical force field, it isn't as sensitive to capacity restrictions as uh, other technologies may be flow restricted, which does lend itself for agricultural use in that you don't have to be quite as sensitive. And with the maintenance, may not be the same at a manned treatment plant that's fully automated as in agricultural sector. It can be a, a, a more prudent selection for that industry, which is where I suppose the original thinking would be. But low maintenance works in any industry if you can achieve it. By the way, I'll, I was there in 2012, so I'll have a pint behind the bar for you for that award. <laughs> Well, it, it happens as I explained. You, what you do is you, um, you put pressure on the system uh, by, and you create selection and therefore you have the organisms that, organisms that form the granulars. And the granular itself is a little house of bi biopolymer. But it, 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 it's about creating the conditions that those organisms will do best. And basically what we do is we, you know, it's like a Olympic swimming pool. We're standing next to the wheat wastewater treatment plant and we say to the organisms, do your best, do your best. And that's what they then do. And it, I'm not making a joke. That's actually how it works. So you, you, you create the circumstances such that those organisms uh, have the chance to flourish and then they create the granulars. And it's not the case that in other treatment plants, those granulars are not there. And it's, we don't add something special or there's no trick, it's, it's that way, yeah. So if there are no more questions, um, I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, uh, Liam Tolton from the Energy and Environment Division Committee uh, to propose a vote of thanks. Well, uh, just let me start off by saying uh, when we decided to, to run this lecture, we weren't really quite sure how it was going to, to form, but I think the very fact that uh, we've had two excellent speakers tonight gave a very good um, presentation on two technologies uh, that really are quite innovative, and I think it, it really demonstrates that you know both concepts have been around for a long time. The Victorians invented essentially these two concepts we're talking about. And it's kind of important, I suppose it's relevant to think that we're here in Tide Road, which was really the home of Victorian engineering in, a, in, um, in Ireland. And yet, we are still saying that as engineers, we shouldn't really accept the status quo. 
what we should do is we should attempt to change even things that you would take for granted and say, you know, what more can you do to wastewater treatment? Well, tonight's speakers proved there's a lot more can be done. And the really important thing, it's really important for us now at this particular time in Ireland because, uh, as we've said earlier, the challenges that uh, wastewater treatment is, has brought to our country now and is going to bring to the country in the next probably two decades are really significant. And I think if we were to have any chance of meeting our targets, as we said, in terms of the improvement in energy efficiency in the public sector, in particular in the wastewater area, um, it is really important that we attempt to really push out the limits of these technologies. And I think the, uh, what we heard tonight was really top class in that respect. What also occurred to me is that um, the, these technologies have been embraced and developed by two relatively small countries. I mean, Ireland and Holland. Uh, Holland is probably, in the population terms, maybe twice or three times or study, something like that. Four. So, relatively small countries compared to, uh, compared to the really huge players. And this demonstrates that uh, we, as a relatively small group of engineers, can really have a pretty, pretty big influence. And I think the two speakers tonight certainly illustrated that point. Um, I guess the, the emphasis in, most, in both speak, uh, talks has been on the municipal wastewater treatment site. It was, uh, Eric mentioned in particular the industrial wastewater treatment site, and uh, I know from my own experience, having been an engineering manager in bulk pharma and been responsible for a, a 10,000 PE equivalent wastewater treatment plant, um, the industrial site presents huge challenges, in particular if you've got a very high load plant. And certainly, had this technology been around 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I started in that, we certainly would have been embracing it because the issue of uh, essentially settling sludge and controlling solids limits is a huge challenge. Ireland has a lot of bulk pharma companies and other organizations that use um, these types of waste treatment plants even before the discharge is discharged to municipal treatment plants. And I think there is a lot of pressure on in those areas, both from the uh, regulatory side, from the EPA to ensure the standards are met, but equally from the fact that a lot of these plants use up quite a bit of the loading of wastewater treatment municipal wastewater treatment plants. So I think there's huge potential for these technologies, in particular uh, the Nareda technology in that area. So I think we've had a, a, a really excellent exposition of what can be achieved um, by pushing out the boundaries of engineering in areas where you would think, well, you know, what more is to be done? Lots more is to be done. We've certainly uh, had a, a really excellent uh, presentation tonight from both speakers. We've had some good questions, hopefully, the folks in, in Cork um, and out in, on the web uh, have enjoyed it as well. And uh, all that remains for me is on behalf of the, um, the uh, Engineers Ireland, our committee, and our two co hosts uh, to <coughs> thank the speakers for giving us uh, a top class uh, presentation tonight. And I believe there may be a magazine article coming out of this as well, so hopefully that will. That will come to fruition at some point, and we all watch for that. And uh, just ask you to uh, recognize that in the usual manner. Thank you.